Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. And to God be all the glory. It's been glorious, glorious 60 days of glory 2020. And I'm excited that this is 60 days of glory extended. Abel Damina is my name. There is a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate that we are bringing all of these messages to you on the various platforms all over the world, especially right here on social media. I want to welcome every one of your friends and family and everybody that has been a consistent part of this ministry right here on social media. You must tell people about it. Do me the favor you've always done as a partaker, a co-laborer with me in the advancement of God's kingdom and bringing light through the gospel into the hearts of men by sharing the videos right now. You know, as many groups are as on your Facebook page, share it to those groups, create watch parties, Let's flood the entire Blue Marble planet with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. You never can tell who is praying sincerely for the truth of the gospel that your sharing will connect that person with these truths that are revealed right here on the platform. Let me also use the opportunity to mention that if you're following and you don't belong to any local church where Christ is revealed, you want to be a part of a local family. The word of God says, God says the solitary in families. God wants you to be in a local church where you are accountable, where you are being taught, and where you also are able to serve the body of Christ with your giftings and callings and be a blessing to the body. And if there's no such a body in your area or community or in your nation, all you need to do today is shoot a mail to me, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we will try to make sure that we connect you with brethren in your area who are part of our church campus in that location so you can get the word of God, be fed the word of God, and grow in the knowledge of Christ. Let me also mention, those of you who would like to get copies of my new books, they are books you don't want to miss having. One of them is The Last Days. is a book on eschatology that deals with all the myths on 666, Antichrist, you know, great tribulation and all that around the last days. The son of perdition, false prophets, false teachers is a whole eschatology material with sound exegesis. The last days. All right. There's another one I released on the office of the pastor. It's a material that equips you to become an effective tool in the hand of Christ for building disciples and building believers in the knowledge of Christ and effectively serving as a pastor over a local church. You know, once you start overseeing two, three, four, five people, that's already a church where two or three are gathered. That's what makes a church. So once you're already growing to where you're beginning to disciple people, you need to read this book on the office of the pastor so you can serve the people of God no matter how many they are effectively. That book is a good book. The third one I release is the Bible truth about material wealth. There's usually a clash between material wealth and the gospel. So this is sound exegesis on what Christ taught, the apostles taught, the New Testament theology where material wealth is concerned and how to use material wealth, you know, in serving Christ and honoring Christ. Then there's the material I also release is a free material. And that book is on eternal salvation in Christ. It deals with all the scriptures that throw doubts on salvation being eternal or salvation being forever. All those scriptures in the Bible, including the famous Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, sound exegesis. But the exciting thing is that this particular book is free. We're giving it free, both in hard copy from our office and online. We have an online edition. Lastly, I want to mention that every day we're going to have the 60 days of glory extended twice a day. 12 noon GMT plus one and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. And it's going to run for one hour, 30 minutes per episode, both at 12 noon and 10 p.m. Because it's going to be a teaching session and then question and answer session with the intercontinental Mr. Michael Bush. We're going to have a blast the whole month of September as we go through the 60 days of glory extended. Let me also mention that in October, we're going to bring back to you Riot and the Counselor. 
The Counselor is a program that will be announced towards the end of September. So you can prepare yourself to be a part of it. Tell everybody about this extended version of the 60 Days of Glory. I'm looking forward to being a blessing to you today as we serve you the grace of God. Fasten your seatbelt as I take you on a gospel adventure into the service where the Spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. Turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 1. We are examining citizens of a beloved country, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. We are a beautiful people because we are beloved of God. So now we said that the prophets are also the fathers. God was not the one who spoke in verse 1. Because in the Greek, the Greek never starts a statement with God. So it is man who spoke. In Luke chapter 24, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All right, so take note of the word, the prophets have spoken. God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake to the fathers by the prophets. The construction is. In sundry times and diverse manners, the prophets spoke to the fathers. Now, in Luke 24, the prophets have spoken. Look at the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Which God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. Since the world began, God, in the Old Testament, it was the mouth of the holy prophets. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, the prophets. So we see that the prophets were the ones who spoke. And in the Hebrew, the word prophet is the word nabi, N-A-B-I. Nabi means spokesperson. One who speaks on behalf of a people. You know, just like in the Nigerian government, somebody could be a spokesperson for the government. Maybe the information minister who will speak on behalf of the government. And that's what the prophets were. It's not like God spoke anything directly. But those folks, the prophets, spoke on his behalf. They are also called seers, or they are called teachers, or they are called expounders. Those prophets are called seers, or teachers, or they are called expounders. In the New Testament, they are called prophets. One who speaks by inspiration, the Greek word prophetis. One who speaks by inspiration or one who speaks from what he has seen or what he has heard. That's what a prophet is. So, he says something from what he has seen or from what he has heard. We also have prophetess. Prophetess because the word prophet, that office is not just a male gift. Females also occupy the office and they are called prophetess. Now, I want us to see something here. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. He is talking about the Old Testament. What was written aforetime. Now, the construction of this terminology is strong. Because it is the word prographo. Pro grapho. You know the word grapho is where you have grapho, grafe, you know. All right, so prographo. Prographo will mean something that was publicly said. It lends credence, firstly, to something that was first said publicly, or something that was first known publicly. So, he is referring to books or materials that everybody knew it was said, then written. You will see that word, prographo, used in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. Oh foolish Galatians, 
who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. There is a word there I'd like you to underline, the word evidently set forth. Evidently set forth. The word evidently set forth, it's the word that has been written or spoken to be crucified. Something that was written or spoken in line with the crucifixion. That is, it happened right before you. Evidently. He is saying that the Galatian church got to know about the crucifixion of Jesus by writing. Somebody wrote about the crucifixion of Jesus. So, they were not in Jerusalem to know. So, he said you have enough evidence in the written word to know that Jesus was crucified. Then brother Paul also repeats the same thing in Ephesians chapter 3 verse number 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. The word afore is the word before in few words. It deals with a message. Not just a historical account. Because when you have the word prographo use, it deals with a message. Program 4 deals with a message, not just a historical account. So when he says in Romans 15, 4, the things which were written are for. He is referring to the message written. The message that was written before. That is, there's a message that came. He is not saying that everything in the Old Testament was written for your learning. Uh -uh. He is talking about the message contained in the accounts of the Old Testament. Which means that not everything in the Old Testament is part of the message. So what brother Paul was making particular reference to here is the message. He is talking about a particular message that the Old Testament carries. Just like Jesus in John chapter 5 verse 39 will say to the Jews. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. The scriptures carries with it a message of my testimony. A message, in other words, the scriptures have a message. The same thing in Romans 15.4. Which says that the scriptures were written afore. And in the writing of the scriptures afore, there was a message written. So, it's what message in the Old Testament that brings comfort. That message contained in the books of the Old Testament is what brings the comfort. Now, it is not by knowing the kind of hairstyle Delilah made. It's not how the queen of Sheba came and fainted at the gate of Solomon. That's not the message of the Old Testament. It's not about how David killed Goliath. That's not the message of the Old Testament. You see? It's not about how Israel defeated the Amalekites. That's not the message of the Old Testament. So, if you go to the Old Testament and you are reading carelessly, that is... You found where it says David went to a cave. And David went to a cave. If you are careful, you will start praying and saying, Oh God, oh God, bring me out of the cave and shield me from my enemies. That is not what the message of the Old Testament is. You cannot use scriptures until it is explained to you. If you remember when we were teaching about, you know, the two kinds of righteousness, I emphatically established that the Old Testament must be explained. The Old Testament must be explained. It's very important. You cannot just be picking verses and, you know, be saying, you know, bone of my bone in flesh of my flesh. You are the bone of my bone, you know. When the bone is connected to the bone and the flesh to the flesh. Now that's not what he's saying there. Look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Next verse. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. He was not discussing marriage in Genesis chapter 2. What was he discussing? The New Testament explains the Old Testament. So what was he talking about when he was talking about bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh? She was taken out of a man. She shall be called woman. Well, look at the way brother Paul will explain it in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 30. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Next verse. This is a great mystery. So what you have in the book of Genesis is a mystery or the revelation of Jesus concealed. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. The church is the bone of Jesus' bones. In Genesis, that Moses was communicating was the revelation of the inseparable union between Jesus and the church. That's why brother Paul, when he quoted from Genesis, he said, but I speak a great mystery concerning Christ and the church. Or... You read about the ravens that brought supply to Elijah in the Old Testament. You know the ravens. And after you read, you now start praying. Oh God, who is the raven of my destiny? Where is the raven of my destiny? Bring to me the raven of my destiny. Well, that's not what he means there. That's not the message. That's not how the Bible is used. There is a message you have to understand from the scriptures. The scriptures carries with it a message. Now, pay attention. Romans 15 again, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning. The word learning is the Greek word didaskalia. Didaskalia means it is written for our teaching. Learning, teaching. That means the Old Testament was given as a teaching material. They are given for teaching. Teaching means that the Old Testament must and ought to be explained. The Old Testament must and ought to be explained. Not to cherry pick scriptures, but to explain them to teach them so that people can be built up. Whatsoever things were written aforetimes, they were written for our learning, for our explanation. They were written as teaching tools for our teaching that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Look at the word patience of scriptures. You know that there was a consistency. That's why the word patience. That in the message of the Old Testament, there is a consistency. That the message of the Old Testament does not differ. That all the 39 books are tied together by one consistent message. That's why the word patience. That we, through patience, the consistency of scripture. The consistency in what was written in that message that we might have hope. Have hope is the word to build upon like a foundation that we have to build upon. That is from the message in the Old Testament we have something that we are building upon. Not that you look at the life of Abraham and you have hope. That's not what he means. He is not saying that you look at the life of Abraham and you have hope. No. He is saying that through the things that were written, through the message of the Old Testament, we can build upon it. Why? Because we know that the epistles 
we are built upon what was written in the Old Testament. The epistles were built upon the message, the consistent message of the Old Testament. That is, we have hope by reason of the consistency of the message of the Old Testament. Now, so we are building upon what? Upon the message. Listen carefully. Not upon their lifestyle. Not upon the lifestyle of Elijah. The lifestyle of Solomon. The lifestyle of Jeremiah. The lifestyle of Elisha. The lifestyle of Moses. No. Our building is not on their lifestyle. We are building upon the message that is consistent. We are never called to imitate. We are only to learn from examples here and there. But even in learning from examples, we have to be very careful. Never say like Joseph, before you get to your destiny, you must go to the pit. There are three P's to your destiny. The pit, the prison, and the palace. And then there is a potiphar that will punish you. But God is using him. No, that is not how they taught in the apostolic church. In the apostolic church, they were not juggling scriptures like that. What is a pit? A pit is the word prophet in training. A pit is the word prophet in training. Means God is raising the prophets in a pit. Prophets in training. What are the characteristics of the pit? Four characteristics of the pit. Number one, the pit is deep. Number two, there is loneliness in the pit. There is loneliness in the pit. And then you hear them shout, that is very deep. Wow, wow, that is very deep. Revelation. Number three, there's no water in the pit. But God is there. There's an opening in every pit. There's an opening in the repeat. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like some good motivational stuff, man? The pit to your destiny. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is not how Bible teaching was done by the apostles. You build upon the message, not the characters. Upon the message, not the characters, neither their lifestyle. You build upon the message, not the characters, neither their lifestyle. So, we build upon the message. Question, what is the message of the Old Testament? The message of the Old Testament is Christ Jesus. So, it's through the consistency of that message that we have hope. Through the consistency of that message that we build upon. The consistency of the message. So, when we study the faults in the Old Testament, what are we looking for? We are looking for the message, not their lifestyle. Remember, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. The word doctrine is the word didascalia, the word learning, teaching, or explanation. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Profitable for teaching. Meaning, there's a message in the scriptures. There's a message in the books of the Old Testament. Look at 1 Corinthians Chapter 10. You read about what happened to the Jews. 40 years in Kadesh Barnea. And their journey from Egypt. And you find Paul write about it. And he starts by saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 6. Pay attention. Now, these things were written or we are our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Next verse. 
Neither be ye idolaters as we are some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Next verse. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Next verse. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Next verse. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Upon whom the ends of the world are are come. Please pay attention. Now, so, the word example there, again, that's why you don't cherry pick scriptures. You don't pick scriptures out of context. Now, fornication is a work of the flesh. Alright? But it is not in the context. It is not in this context. The message of this context is beyond fornication. Because that's not what he is saying. He is saying that these things happen to them for examples. The word examples means a precedent. Is the word tupos. T-U-P-O-S. Tupos in the Greek means pattern. Pattern. For example, a precedent or a pattern. It is not used for something you should follow after. Not necessary. You will see the same word used in Romans chapter 5 verse 14. Nevertheless, that reign from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not seen after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. About Adam, he said, he was a figure of sin that was to come. That is, Adam is an example of sin. So, he is saying, this is an example or a description of sin. They lusted after evil things and they were destroyed. He is not asking you to see an example of what can happen to you. No. No. Again, restrict your thought pattern to what they did. They lusted, they murmured, they lusted after evil things. They committed fornication, they rose up to play. So, he says, that is a pattern. Now, when the Bible teaches us to follow examples, we don't have to follow just anything. The example he told us to follow is the example of faith. Be followers of those who through faith. Those are the examples we are asked to follow. We are taught to look at faith in Christ. And sometimes we assume there could be a repeat of that. No. Scripture doesn't teach that. Now look at Romans chapter 4 verse 12. Pay attention. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. Remember, we said the word steps is singular, not plural. That means there was a step Abraham took. What was the step? He believed God. He believed God. So he said, therefore... If we believe God like Abraham, we are justified by faith. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Verse 8. And the scripture foreseen that God will justify the hidden through faith, preach before the gospel unto Abraham saying 
In thee shall all nations be blessed. Look at verse 9. Oh, I love this one. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Look at Romans chapter 4 verse 3. Talking about Abraham's faith. For what say of the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He believed and it was credited to his account righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 4 verse 23. Abraham's faith. Now it was not written for his sake alone. That it was imputed to him. Next verse. Glory to God. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him the rest of Jesus our Lord from the dead. So it's about his faith. Now, we are not told to ever emulate the saints of old. Jesus, in Luke chapter 10 verse 24, look at Jesus' commentary. For I tell you, Many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. So there is nothing in them to emulate. They have desired to see what were seen and even didn't see it. Both prophets and kings, they've desired to see these realities. So we are not supposed to follow after them. They don't have anything that is superior to what we have. Now, we can teach from them. But we are not supposed to live after them. He said they desired to see those things they didn't see. That includes Abraham. To hear those things you are hearing now, they didn't hear. You see that? In Matthew 13, he repeats the same thing. Now, so that is why the writer of Hebrews will say in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Verse 1, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Abraham inclusive Moses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. Next verse. Looking unto Jesus is the Greek word look away. Look away from the elders in Hebrews 11 who by faith obtain good report. Look away from them unto Jesus the author and finisher of faith. Jesus the author and finisher of faith. Look away from them to Jesus. Because Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. He is the end point. He is the end point of everything that the Old Testament fathers and prophets believed for. He is the result of what they wanted. So we cannot try to be like people who didn't have what we have. We cannot try to be like people who didn't have what we have. But we can teach from them. That's exactly what we are doing, but we are not called to follow them. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Look at it again. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written... Not for our examples. They are written for our admonition. Remember, what things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience, consistency of the message, and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. There's a careful use of the word here. He says, example, that is a pattern. A pattern of their lives. And we are written, and the word there is not the same as 
kai. It is the word di, which is the word moreover. So, they were written moreover. Look at it, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, in the amplified version. These things befell them by the way of a figure, an example, and warning to us. They were written to admonish and fit us for right action by good instruction. We in whose days the ages have reached their climax, their consummation and concluding period. That is, he is making a different statement that those things happened to them as a pattern of their lives. Whose lives we will see. We are not to copy. But we will see their lives. Now. They are written for our admonition. The word counsel. Where you have an instruction or teaching. Admonition. Is the word now seller. N-O-U-T-S-E-L-A. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4, we see the use of the word admonition. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bring up your children in the admonition, in the teaching, in the counsel. Not seller, something to think about, like knows, something to think. That is, it was written for us to think upon. For us to think upon. So the question is, what exactly are we to think upon? Now pay attention, this is key. What are we to think upon? Or what exactly are we to think upon? Should we say that if you sin, you'll be destroyed? Or if you sin, God is displeased and you'll be destroyed of self? No, that's not what the message is in that text. He says, admonition upon whom the end of the world has come. What is ends of the world? What we call the last days. What is the last days? The day of redemption. The Amplified Version calls it the meeting of the times or the consummation of the ages. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, that the things that do appear were not made of things that do appear. Now, in the meeting of the ages, those times now ended up all the different times of the Old Testament, all of it consummated in one time. And that time is the time that we're in. The closure of all that the Old Testament people hoped for, prophesied, looked forward to, looked for, all of it climaxed in the resurrection of Jesus. So that resurrection is the last days. The redemptive work of Christ is the culmination of the ages or the meeting of the ages or what we call the day of Christ. The time of Abraham, the times of Noah, the times of Abel, the times of Moses, all of them met in Christ. The meeting of the ages. So he now says, upon whom the meeting of the ages have come. Which is what we call the last days or the day of Christ. The meeting of the ages. See the terminology there in Hebrews 9.26. The same terminology. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world had he appeared. In the consummation of the times. Has he appeared? What is the consummation of the times? To put away sin. By the sacrifice of himself. So the consummation of the time. The end of the ages. Is the sacrifice of himself. End of the world. The day of Christ. Or the meeting of the ages. So he says. This end of the world. 
this meeting of the ages has come to us. It has come to us. Remember, Paul is giving a historical account. And you must realize very importantly the people he's referring to because you can lose the lesson here and begin to scare believers from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Meanwhile, Paul was teaching faith. And you begin to scare believers once you do not see what the message of that text is. So the question is, who was brother Paul addressing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? He was addressing Israel. When they left Egypt for Canaan. And particularly in the wilderness called Kadesh Barnea. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I will not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Question. Those fathers, is any of them your father? Huh? No. The father of the Jews. Jewish fathers. Specific people he's addressing. Look at the description in verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Next verse. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now. God was not well pleased. The question is, what exactly does he mean by God was not well pleased? He means that God was not well pleased with them because they rejected the message. They rejected the message. So the people is describing here, we are not believers. They were not believers. So that 1 Corinthians 10 is not an example for believers. Because the people is addressing were not believers. Let us see another description of these same people because they were not believers. You will see the message in Numbers 11, 12 to 14. You can read that for personal study. But I'm going to read the same context in Hebrews 3, 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice. Next verse. Harden not your heart as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Next verse. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. So the people is dealing with here were the people in the wilderness. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. Next verse. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What sin is he talking about here? Unbelief. Look at verse 14 to 16 of the same Hebrews 3. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Next verse. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Next verse. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Did you see that? How be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. We are talking about the same set of people in 1 Corinthians 10. They are not believers. Look at verse 17 and 18 of Hebrews 3. 
But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Next verse. And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So, they were not believers. Hebrews 3.19. So, we see that they could not enter in why? Because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 now. Hey. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard. So, they heard the word, but did not believe it. That was the situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So, are they our examples? No. Was Abraham an example of faith in the Old Testament? Yes. Those folks in 1 Corinthians 10, are they example of believers in the Old Testament? No. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. For we, glory, we which have believed do enter where? Into rest. Who entered rest? We that believe. He saw that they would not enter rest. Why? Unbelief. So are they our example? Why? We believe. They didn't believe. So they cannot be our examples. Is it getting clear now? So what exactly is he saying? Pay attention. First Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. How many of you have heard that scripture quoted many times for Christians? They quote it all the time. But let him that take it, thinketh he standeth take it, lest he fall. They are quoting out of context. Because that's not what that scripture is saying. The key word there is, thinketh. He didn't say, let him that standeth take it, lest he fall. Once I'm standing, I can't fall now. But let him that thinketh he standeth. So he's not standing. He's only thinking he's standing. Because as he's thinking he's standing, he's really not standing. That's the key word. Let him that thinketh. The key word there is thinketh. Thinketh is the Greek word dokio. Dokio means to assume. To appear to. It means an assumption. It is used in classical Greek for a subjective opinion. That is, you are not objective. They are subjective. Or you are subjectively thinking an assumption. You will see that word in Matthew 3.9, 1 Corinthians 3.18. Seem to be seen to be an assumption. Let him that thinketh or let him that is assuming take heed lest he falls. That's a bad English. If I was translating that verse in today's English, I will have said, take heed not to fall. Take heed not to fall. It's not like take it not to fall out of salvation. The fall there is the same that James will say something like count it all joy when you fall into diverse tests and trials. The word fall in James is different from this fall. 
But just for you to see how it is also used somewhere else. The word fall there means not to come against. Not to come. Take heed lest he comes against. But the word fall in this context is the word, word under. Every time it is used in Greek, it is the word pipto. It means to fall under or to cave. To cave. So fall under what? He is saying, let him that assumes he is standing take heed. Watch, lest he falls under. Now, hold that interpretation. Look at that First Corinthians again, 10, 13. Let's see what he's saying. You should take it not to fall under. There had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted? Above that, you are able. But will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Is it getting clear? So, Paul acknowledges in his writing in 1 Corinthians 10 that we are all tempted. What did he say about those folks in the old covenant? They were all tempted. So he's saying, you also will be tempted. But there's no temptation taking you. That is not common to man. Amen. Somebody say with me, it's common. Okay. No temptation has taken you that is not common to man. The phrase common to man is one word in the Greek. It's the word anthropinos. Anthropinos means it's human. So it is human to be tempted. It's human to be tempted, you know, to murmur. It's human to be tempted to commit fornication. Is human to be tempted. It's not strange. So he has told you examples of temptation that are common within human beings. And he's not using believers because believers have believed and believers have entered rest. He can only use unbelievers. So, he is saying they were tempted and lusted after other things. They were into idolatry and fornication. Then he now said, for you, no temptation that is not human. So, temptations are not demonic. Temptations are because we are humans. James 1.13 let no man say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempted he any man. Next verse. But every man, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And for these common problems, you don't need to be looking for deliverance. Because it is for these common problems that some preachers will now tell you to go for deliverance. 40 days fasting. 50 days fasting. Meanwhile, all of these are common to man. They are activities. They are not demonic. They are things that are common to man. And then he now finishes it. He now says, if Jesus was tempted, you also will be tempted. Why was Jesus tempted? Because he was a man. He was a human. So all humans get tempted. But they were not destroyed because they were tempted. It's common. Okay? So what destroyed them in Kadesh Barnea was not fornication. It was not murmuring. Those are common things within human activities. And for believers, God is faithful. He will make a way of escape with the temptation. Now, so why were they destroyed? They were destroyed because they didn't please God. They were destroyed because of unbelief. Look at that 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There are no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted. Above that you are able. But will with the temptation 
also make a way of escape that you may be at it. Somebody said to me very loud, there is a way of escape. All right, so he is faithful. He will provide a way of escape. I checked the word way of escape is the Greek word ekbasis. E-K-B-A-S-I-S. Means success. Used for a good result. Just like James thought and said that God has provided a way of escape. The authority for us to overcome temptation. What was the way of escape? He now says flee. Flee. So he is teaching that temptation is common to humanity. But the man who has believed God, God is faithful. He will make a way of escape. God will bail you out. God is faithful. He will make a way of escape. That is, you'll be able to bear it. Amen. I said amen. So why did brother Paul write 1 Corinthians chapter 10? To establish the faithfulness of God in making a way of escape for believers out of every temptation. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. Out of every temptation. Those of you that are going through trials and temptations and tests right now, God is faithful and is making a way of escape for you and you're going to bear it and come out of it more victorious than you were ever. You're going to come out of it without a scar. You're going to come out of it without any impediment. You're going to come out of it without shame and embarrassment. Why? God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you can handle and he will with the temptation make a way of escape. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is Paul establishing the faithfulness of God for believers to make a way of escape. Can somebody shout hallelujah? So he's not saying we should follow the examples. He's not saying we should learn from them. No, he is saying all that they went through were things that were common to men. The only thing that destroyed them was that they didn't believe the gospel. But for us believers, even when we go through temptations that are common to men, God is faithful. He will make a way of escape that you may bear it and escape out of it. And I have news for you. You're coming out of everything that has, has come against you. Everything that has brought pain and shame. Everything that is threatening your life. I declare right now, wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, victory is yours right now. You are not fighting for victory. You are fighting from victory, enforcing the victory that is yours in Christ Jesus. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you can handle. And he has made a way of escape. Amen. I thought somebody would shout, you're coming out. Say it as a prophecy to somebody, you are coming out. Yeah, you're coming out, you're coming out. Yeah, you're coming out, you're coming out. You won't be trapped in, you won't be kept there, you won't be stuck there. You're coming out. And it doesn't matter how long it's been lingering. It doesn't matter how long it's been hanging. It doesn't matter how long it's been there. You're coming out of it. God has made a way of escape for you. Now we command you in the name of Jesus, wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, identify that way of escape. Identify that way of escape. Identify that way of escape. Victory is yours now in the name of Jesus. Satan, get your hands off in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. And I speak a miracle over those who need miracles. I speak favor for those who need favors. And I speak the blessing over everyone hearing the sound of my voice. The revelation of God's word grows big on your inside. Until nothing else lies. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Glory! Okay, thank you for joining me. I take this from, um, I just take this from, I uh, think this should come from South Africa. It doesn't say where, but I take it in all the same. Dr. Mrs. Ade Yanju says, um, good afternoon, sir. Good uh, evening to you. I just listened to a 25-minute teaching you made on take control of your marriage. Anything like that? 
Yeah, maybe I should. Okay, I mean, all right. Yeah. So my question is, what should I do in a situation where my husband doesn't seem to take his role, as explained in this teaching? And most of the times, I try to make us um, intimate as spiritual matters. It tends to be hostile. So most of uh, all the spiritual responsibilities of his are taken up by me, and he seems to be content with that. So I have to uh, continue to ensure the spiritual atmosphere in our home is strong, especially with our children being young, so as to ensure they are spiritually strong. Thanks in anticipation of your response, sir. Well, the you first know. thing as it has to do with marriage, like we always say to couples, the way you started the relationship is critical. The way you started out as a couple, a husband, a wife, even before you even got married, a number of things must be taken into consideration. Don't, don't just get excited and marry blindly. No, no, no. You need to take note of some things. However, the marriage in question, since your husband is shying away from spiritual responsibility, Keep on taking responsibility for your home. Don't give the devil any room. And don't, you know, be weary. Don't slack. Take full charge. While you are in charge of ensuring that everything spiritual is covered in the home, be praying for your husband that he will wake up to his spiritual responsibilities and be the man he is supposed to be where the spirituality of your home is concerned. So that's what you've got to do for now because you can't throw in the towel and you can't start fighting him because you'll be giving the devil a room to do more havoc. How be it, you just see it as, you know, going through a sacrifice for the sake of Christ and for the cause of the same gospel that you will have been preaching to other people, you know, um, passing it across to your home. Okay, from South Africa, let's get into Namibia. And um, this longish one comes from Anna Sanghirip. She's writing from Namibia. Papa, would you please agree with me in prayer for my sister, Epsilon, and brother Joshua for a job selection. I've done all there is to do in making sure their job applications are submitted. Thank you, doctor. Father, in the name of Jesus, we agree right now in faith with this family. And we call for jobs, we call for opportunities, and we declare miracles for them for jobs to be made available. And we thank you for the connection. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anna continues, Papa, according to Mark eleven twenty three, how many times early can I speak to my body to speed up the process of healing manifestation? I'm not too sure whether it's documented anywhere, but I need your advice or suggestion. Please, Papa, thank you. You keep speaking to your body until you see what you're looking for comes forth. You know, J James gave an analogy in the book of James and his mama, Dr. Rachel, that shared this and taught me this. Oh. It, yeah, she taught me this. Oh, Papa, you also get taught. Oh, sure. Oh. I learn. I'm teaching okay. Mr. Bruce. I that, like that, learning. That, that, <laughs> that can be a relief. <laughs> right, That's so, so consoling. Yes, yeah, so we're in Bible study. And she read that scripture in James, where the Bible says we, we put bits in horses' mouths so we can control them. Mm. And then the ship, as big as it is, is controlled by the rudder where the captain sits. So... When she read that in James chapter 3, then he says the tongue is a powerful member of our body really? and it can set the entire course of nature on, on fire. fire. So she now said to me, honey, you know what the Bible is saying? I said, no. She said, you know, there are two situations here. The first one is a horse. You know, when you're in a horse and you want a horse to initiate a turn, mm. you just need to pull the bits and the horse will make the turn instantly. But a big sheep doesn't make an instant turn. The captain will have to initiate the turn and it takes a while wow. Before the, the tone, you know, takes effect. So she said to me, sometimes circumstances of life are like that. There are some circumstances you just speak, they happen. Mm. And there are others, when you start speaking, you've initiated, but you've got to wait for it to go. So that's what I'm about to show you, that when you speak to your body and you still have symptoms, stay in faith and keep speaking and keep speaking and keep speaking until you see what you're saying manifest in the physical. That's profound. Yeah. Okay, let's continue with Anna in um, Namibia. Papa, I have a sister who is 47 years old. Almost every second or third year, she will refuse to take her HIV medication in the name of having been healed or prayed for. Every time she does that, she ends up almost dead. Doctors had to put her again on the same medication over and over for her to recover. Even right now, she's busy recovering, and the doctors have told her that if she stops taking them again, she will die. She's been born again for more than 20 years. She used to be in a born-again church, but left to attend L-E-L-C-I-N church. Papa, is this a kind of deception that she thinks she's healed and throws away medication? Or am I the one who is wrong in being concerned? 
Yeah. Instead of allowing her to exercise her faith, please, Papa, help me. As a helper, I need your advice. I don't want her to die. That's what Dr. Casey, Casey Price calls faith, foolishness, and presumption. <laughs> faith, foolishness, foolishness and, presumption. and presumption. So she is in presumption and in foolishness. Because HIV already tells her her immunity is low. Is low. So she needs her medication to keep her immunity stable while she keeps believing God for a miracle. She stays with her medication. It's not faithlessness. It's wisdom. She stays with her medication while she keeps believing for her healing. And then once it is confirmed medically that she's healed, she throws away the medication. There's nothing wrong with that. Same thing with people who use glasses. Mm. You don't have to throw away your glasses sure. because you believe for healing. Absolutely. You keep putting them on, but you keep checking. Once you find out that your healing has manifested, then you do away with it. Don't just take steps that will hurt you and they harm you and hurt you in the name of faith, which is not faith. Faith is standing on God's word until you see the answer manifest. And while standing on God's word, you do the needful. Eat if you need to eat, sleep if you need to sleep, take your medications, do all of that. But your faith is strong in the fact that God will do what he has already said he has done for you physically in your body. So, you know, you know, Papa, again, this is profound for me because most um, churches will not teach this. They will just tell you, oh, you have to throw away this, you have to show faith, you have to display faith, you have to believe and all of that. So for, for you, wh when does this turning point uh, come? I know well about the yes. prosperity message, but about this kind of uh, messaging. Yes. Is, it, is it also new for you? Or well, is something you've been As I began to over study over time, as I study the word, I, you know, I see the foolishness. You know, and being a pastor, I've seen people who come to this church, hear me teach faith and just throw away their, you know, whatever they, they used to depend on to keep them. And then they get into crisis. And then we pray and find out this is what happened. Years ago, somebody came here to attend Bible school from another country and we didn't know she was on medication. We gave her form. She said she was not on medication at all. She got in here and she got into crisis and she was in coma. Then we found out she was on medication before she left her country to come. And when she was coming here, she now says she's going to an atmosphere of faith. She threw away everything. She got in here and got into crisis. It was such a, and I was not in the country. I was out of the country. It, it, it's a situation, you can't believe what happened. So we've had such situations. So that's why I keep teaching these things so people can, you know, take responsibility for their lives and do what they need to do. You know, not just give them to the devil to destroy them. Now, the last question she asked was... Um, was about um, the... Uh, uh, angels have no power of their own. Okay, angels, mm. angels. angels. And, and then they have no power to take decisions on anything. So will they be held responsible by God? Yes, they will. The says we shall judge them. We shall judge the angels. And the angels that disobey in the beginning are reserved for judgment. So yes, if they miss me, they will be taken care of the judge. Okay, let's go to Zambia next and says, my name is Lord Mwebler and I'm writing from Zambia. Says I had a certain pastor teaching that John the Baptist was killed because he danced. How true is this? I really need scriptural references. <laughs> I don't know, ask the pastor to give you. There's no such thing in the Bible. Okay. <laughs> However, John the Baptist went to prison because when Jesus came, John the Baptist's mission expired when Jesus arrived. John himself announced, I must decrease and Jesus will increase. But when Jesus showed up, instead of John to decrease, John did not decrease. John started prophesying to power. He started speaking uh, to, to, the, to the government, which is not part of his uh, assignment as a man of God. He went and overdid himself. And the Herod got angry and arrested him and put him in prison. And that is how that guy's life ended. And don't forget, the reason why it even effectively destroyed him was because John was in bitterness. John was offended in Jesus. The same John that said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. That same John said, Go and ask Jesus, is he the real one? Or should we look for another? He was in offense. And when you are in offense, it is called offended. When you are offended, you are off and ended. Off and ended. You create room for the devil to take advantage of you. Okay, still from Zambia, let's uh, move from one part of Zambia to the other. Hi, I'm Reverend Mvula from Zambia on the Pentecostal Assemblies of God, Zambia. You are a blessing to us. I'm really, really blessed by your teachings. Thank you so much, sir. Do you at time invite pastors for pastors' conference or teachings across the nations? If yes, then tell me how I can participate. Thank you. Yes, we do a lot of international ministers' conferences like once or twice a year. We will have had one going right now, but because of the COVID situation. So next year, yeah, we're looking forward. If all things 
you know, get back to normal to have an international conference. And when it is about time, we will put out adverts and all that, and you will get to know, you know, about it. Okay, so let's um, take this one. Doesn't say from where, so I guess it's from in part in Africa. It says good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, Daddy, please, I have followed your teachings for about two years now, and I believe that demons can't possess a believer. But then my brother has been mentally sick for about um, three months, and I've prayed for him, possibly got him born again, but the situation is not going in line with what I want for him, which is healing. Please, I want you to pray for him and my dad who is paralyzed. His name is Abraham, and my dad's name is Pastor Samuel. Thank you. Father, we pray for Pastor Samuel, and we pray for Abraham, Mr. Abraham, wherever they are right now. In the name of Jesus, we ask for a miracle, a miracle of healing, a miracle of restoration, a quickening of their bodies and a quickening of their minds. Satan, get your hands off. And in the name of Jesus, we command your body quickened and we command your mind restored in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're still in Zambia. How are you, Brother Bush and Papa? I know you are well. Papa, I want to thank you for the work you're doing on another level in knowledge now because we're teaching. Okay, that is on another level of knowledge now because we're teaching. May God bless you and comfort you in Jesus' name. Amen. To those who are talking, um, Papa, uh, one day they will follow you. Okay, we take another one still as we move around the continent. Uh, Mr. Bush, my name is Eunice. You seem to be favoring. You seem to be favoring those on Facebook Live. I just want to remind you that there are some of us also watching you on YouTube Live. Try and remember us. Instagram also, and Twitter. <laughs> we also have live comments. Yes. Papa, thanks for the great work you're doing. I deeply appreciate the knowledge of Christ you're sharing with us. Just one question. Papa, when is that book coming out? The one on the end of the world. I'm so waiting. <laughs> the last days. You will thank soon you. be out. Mm. Last days will soon be out and material prosperity. They will soon be out. Okay, I, we'll move out of um, Zambia in a moment, but let me just see if we can take, um, uh, let me go to YouTube Live. Uh, yes, I don't yes. like to be accused and then I don't, yes, I don't yes. acquit myself clean. Yes. Okay, so, wow, it's a crowd here on YouTube Live, 259 of them right now, but I can't take all of you. I just take those I see. Yes. Patience um, Younger, Shedra Kukata, Sofo Bwachi, um, you know, Iniben, Regunda. Grace uh, Enogeru, Wanka Bache, Rose B, Mary Tiemo, Pato and Pato, Agbabu Genevieve, Victoria Ogolo. I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Just keep being with us and uh, I come back to you as we progress. I can see also now Pundi Kono, Ruth Zulu, Stets Muchini. Patients, younger, and many more. I come back, but that is from uh, YouTube Live. Yes. And then I know that very soon the Instagram, Instagram people Twitter, are coming after me. Come after I'll, come, <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But let's move from Zambia to Malawi. Hello, Dr. Damina. My name is uh, Yamikani Mpikamezo from Malawi. Thank you very much for revealing Christ to me. I followed you for over 10 years now, and my mind is full of Christ now. I have this question in Matthew 1928. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the, the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Thus the twelve include Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. <laughs> yes, at that time, yeah. Remember, Jesus was just giving them a parable. So, and a parable is not revelation knowledge. A parable is just an earthly situation used to bring out a message. So, yes. Judas was part of it because as at that time, Judas has not yet betrayed Christ. Okay, so he continues. That's still from um, Yamikani. He says, because in John 17, 12, Jesus called Judas the son of petition. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. But the son of petition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Will Judas enter heaven and rule together with Christ? Help me, Papa. Judas was never saved. He was never born again. He never believed. But he was part of them. He, but he never believed. So Judas is not in heaven. Hello, welcome to the show. Your name, where are you calling from? My name is Moses Humo. I'm calling from Okobo House Center, too. Okay. Please, Papa, um, I want you to throw more light on First Corinthians chapter 11, okay. from verse 23 to 27 for me. 
Oh my goodness, you want me to teach everything I've taught for two weeks? <laughs> because I don't what 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 light do you want there? Because if it's a true light, that's to teach everything. And I've been teaching that for two weeks now. If there's a particular thing I can explain, but if it's the whole thing, we don't have that kind of time. Okay, so perhaps you just send an email. Yes. Okay, send an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and that would be treated. Okay, this I don't know why that's a following, apart from the other um, bullets, uh, you know, that fly my way from when they should be beheading to Papa. The they, bullet they, in you. Yeah. <laughs> There's another one here. Maybe there are too many of them. <laughs> so, Mr. Bush, please interpret Baba for the benefit of the international community, sir. Great grace abound towards you. Please okay. ask him. I join him. <laughs> ask Mr. No, Bush. No, no. Baba is actually a Papa that yeah. has raised the bar. That, that's what it is. But... You know, I don't want those questions, so I've gone back to my papa, <laughs> finally, you know. So let, let's move from, um, where were we just now? That was in Malawi, when Malawi, so look, can we go to Lesotho? I want us to go to Lesotho quickly, quickly, quickly. Lesotho, where are you? I have so many, many, many uh, comments. And that, I, I need to apologize to you if we don't... Um, come to you easily, you should understand. It's um, very difficult to go through all of this and navigate all through the world. There's another caller. Hello. Oh, hello. Yeah, thank hello. you for joining us. Your name, where are you calling from? Um, my name is Amy. I'm calling from the UK. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, okay. So, um, just want to appreciate Papa for the true gospel that is preaching to us. I mean, Papa, you have saved my life. I literally just started listening to you um, last day, from last day, I've been listening to you. I get to meet you in August last day when you came to Koizu. Okay. Me and my sister, Joyce, yeah, we get to meet you. And we thank God for the night. We are grateful for what you're doing. We change the gospel to us, you know, setting us free. I've been in a church that for so many years that it's been so confusing. It's literally like a cult. To be honest, you know, we are, we are told to do different kind of things. We have to go to the mountain twice a year. We have to define the anointing or this and that. You know, they'll be giving you different messages. The child is going to die. This one, that they want this to happen. That that's going to happen. God is saying this. God is saying that. You know, and it got so tiring. You know, even up to the business, everything from passing, getting to the church. Everything just went down, and I've like been in a bondage for for that years. And coming out, obviously, it was like a, um, you know, there's always a fear of oh, something bad is going to happen. I'm supposed to be under coverage, this and that. You know, mm -hmm. I have to be under the church coverage. If I'm not there, there's something going to happen to my children, to my husband, to myself. Oh, for I thank you for letting me know you cry. You know, the way you preach, what you preach, how you preach it, the authority yep. that I live in right now. I am grateful and I Please. say thank you, Papa. Please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please. I literally don't have no question because I just go to, I just, you always answer my question once you're preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. That's how it's supposed to be. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Fantastic. Hello. Hello. Thank Hello. you for joining us. You know where you're calling from? I'm Ramon Ane from Botswana. Okay, Ramon. Bless you. From Botswana. But I want to use this opportunity to, to thank God for your life. God has used you to bless me. Since four years now that I know you, I've been following you since I've turned around. Praise God. In fact, I have from you that you say that any any child that has a good mother and that the mother fitted her, fitted him very well, he has no need of looking somewhere for food. Sure. You have fitted me to the extent that I'm satisfied, that I'm no longer looking outside, looking anywhere else for the word of God. Praise God. Only what you said, only what you preach is what I believe. And I stand for it because you have worked wonderful in my life and in my family. Yes, Despite the hurdles, but still I stand on the word of God. 
So, Papa, I just want to thank you very much. I just want to thank you very much. I'm going to thank you very much and say God bless you and bless your family. Bless and you. bless this ministry. And I want to tell you that I will stand with you to make sure that this world go anywhere all over the world. Praise I will stand with you day and night. I will surely stand with you, sir. Amen. But there's only one question I want to ask you, sir. Okay. Um, there is a man of God uh, that I do respect, I do honor in terms of giving uh, honor. But yesterday night he sent me a message that we need to pray. That uh, uh, we have to pray for three days of prayer every 12 midnight. That uh, that we need to pray for God to for divine inheritance. But to say that yesterday, I'm not comfortable with that word because of your word. We have teachers that will learn from you. What divine inheritance I can? Meanwhile, God is Christ has become our inheritance. Exactly. We have God begotten our inheritance in Christ. Yes. So, but I haven't given him answer. So, sir, I want you to clarify me. Should I? Stand? But uh, in my spirit, I'm not clear. I'm not, uh, in fact, ready to participate in that prayer with him because I know who I am in Christ. I know better now. Yep. So I, I'm no longer to and flow in the word of God. Yep. No matter whoever you are, no matter the title or bishop or whatever, I always stand with you, sir. So, sir, I need more clarification. Thank you very much, and God bless you, sir. Thank you, Raymond. This is your time to preach to that pastor. Preach to him. Teach him this thing you have just said here. If you teach him what you just said here, you will have helped his life. Christ is your inheritance. What kind of prayer for three days? And why 12 midnight? Why 12 midnight? Because there's no timing in the realm of this. It was 12 in, in your country, maybe 6 a.m. in another country, or even 10 p.m. in another country. So uh, time does not, the spirit world doesn't operate by time. So again, it's another manipulative weapon. So you get to him, take the gospel. What you hear me teach that you've been following, this is the time to pump it to him. Open his eyes, bring him to a place of clarity. Bless your heart. Wow. Okay. Papa, Papa. <laughs> Let's come closer back home. There's no time. Lagos, here we come. Greetings to you, Christocentric Papa Damina and multinational Mr. Bush. My name is Godwin Adams. I'm in Ajal, Lagos. Papa, I've come to realize that being ignorant of the scriptures is worse than COVID-19. So the body of Christ, thank you in no small measure for your labor in the gospel in bringing so much revelational knowledge to believers across the world. I believe that if the Bible were to be written in this day and age, your name would have been mentioned in it. My question, it is obvious that some of the songs we've been singing in church contradicts the very revelation of scriptures. Although most of those songs, especially the hymns, were written when there was no light of scriptures. So it's almost impossible to withdraw them from circulation. Please, Papa, how would you encourage singers and musicians in the body of Christ to write and compose songs backed by sound biblical doctrine? Hmm. I feel that since much efforts have been taken to correct most wrong biblical teachings, it should also reflect in the songs that are written. Papa, do you agree to this? Thanks once again. Fully, I agree with you fully. And that's why we're speaking, teaching and teaching. So music ministers in churches will begin to take the sound doctrine of God's word and we write all our songs. So we begin to sing songs that agree with our identity, songs that re reflect what we believe in, and songs that are a true confession of our faith. We don't just sing for singing's sake at all. And, you know, and the moment you get into a place of revealed knowledge, you become selective. When you hear songs, you're, you're checking because discernment becomes very sharp. So music ministers that are very smart will start writing songs now that the body of Christ will sing now and tomorrow. From Lagos, Nigeria, we're going to make a short move outside the country. We're going to, to Europe, France, and Paris. Ola is in Paris. Ola, come on, Sava. It says, peace from God be on you and the brethren. Glory. This is Ola from Paris. Uh, Papa, I'd like to thank you for your life and the great work. And hello to the Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. My question, Papa, is where would we be during the 1,000-year millennial reign with Christ on earth or in heaven? Also, would there be death again during this period, as in Isaiah 65, 20? We're already reigning with Christ. We're already reigning right now. They that receive the abundance of grace 
which is the gift of righteousness, they reign. We are reigning with Christ right now. How would the dead before Christ's message be judged, especially our fathers in Africa who did not have access to the gospel? Well, uh, you can't assume in theology, that's assumption. We don't assume. God must have reached them through because God wants everybody to be saved. Okay, Papa, let, let's uh, make a short one to Japan now, even as my producer tells me. We need to round off in another two minutes. Narumi, I'm writing from Japan. My name is Narumi. Thank you so much for your teachings, Delhi. These days, I've come to realize my struggle and would like to hear your opinion. Papa, I tend to care a lot about what other people think about me, and that sometimes brings fear into my heart. Actually, I feel this is a lot to do with our culture. I tend to worry little things between relationships with Japanese people. Somehow, I don't feel that in relationships with other people's with people from other countries. As a believer, I want to be free from it and be bold. When it comes to sharing the gospel with non-believers, I'm rather bold. However, when I talk to believers about the truth, I'm not as bold. I'm sure as I continue to learn from you, I will eventually be free from what other people think. Could you please recommend me any of your teachings which would help me in this area? And Papa, were you bold from the beginning? If you have any experiences, I would love to hear. Narumi, uh, Japan. I wasn't bold from the beginning. I remember the first time I was asked to pray in church, I ran to the toilet. As soon as they called my name to pray, I took off straight to the toilet and I waited until the service was over. They had to come and fetch me out because I was just, I didn't know what to say. Papa, but, papa. but as I began to grow and I began to learn and I began to grow, you know, today I'm bold. So papa, papa. keep coming, keep coming. Papa, keep we coming. love that uh, history. Yes. We're, we're coming for you sometime in the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Facebook Live. Thank you, Freedom. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Felicitole, thank you. Pauline, Eliza, thank you. Nana Adwa, thank you. Emma Kujo, thank you. Elizabeth Yemi, thank you. Abel Oebel, thank you. Titi Emma, thank you. Abbas Regent, thank you. And uh, Chidima Neoma, I'd like to thank you. And the list goes on and on. We're going to Papa in um, New York. Yes. And Eze, writing from New York, thank you, Papa, for the revelation you're bringing to the body of Christ. It's mind-blowing, and I pray that God's... Uh, uh, will be multiplied, God's doing, God's activities, God's goodness be multiplied in your life and ministry. My question goes this way. Is there any difference between the love in John 3.16 and that of First John 3.1? Oh, uh, no. Same. Same, same. love. Yep. The whole same love. Papa, we've got to go. Papa, we've got to go. Sacrificial work of Christ. Papa, we've got to go. Yeah. Because our producer says so. I'd like to just say thank you, the 60 Days of Glory Studios. Everyone joins me um, to say bye-bye. Pastor Praise and Elder Mrs. Wingyme and Praise Okon. Uh, Pastor I.J. Query, that's my producer. Pastor Ishid and all the cameramen. Everyone, every technician, every sound engineer. This is Michael Bush bringing Papa for the closing ceremonies. Mr. Bush, thank you, man. We appreciate and love you. And everybody else, it's a blessing to have all of you connected. We love you. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Till we see you again tomorrow evening. Be blessed good and good night. Good night from your Nigeria. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I know you have been blessed. It's been an exciting time of teaching, answering questions, and bringing clarity to you where the word of God and the doctrine of Christ is concerned. And I'm excited that you are also going to help me spread the news, get more people to hook up to this 60 days of glory extended so they can be built up, edified, and they can grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you're following and you don't belong to any local church where Christ is revealed, you want to be a part of a local family. The word of God says, God says the solitary in families. God wants you to be in a local church where you are accountable, where you are being taught, and where you also are able to serve the body of Christ with your giftings and callings and be a blessing to the body. And if there's no such a body in your area or community or in your nation, all you need to do today is shoot a mail to me, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we will try to make sure that we connect you with brethren in your area who are part of our church campus in that location so you can get the word of God, be fed the word of God, and grow in the knowledge of Christ. Let me also mention, those of you who would like to get copies of my new books, they are books you don't want to miss having. One of them is The Last Days, is a book on eschatology that deals with all the myths on 666, Antichrist, you know, great tribulation and all that around the last days. The son of perdition, false prophets, false teachers is a whole eschatology material with sound exegesis. The last days. All right. There's another one I released on the office of the pastor. It's a material that equips you 
to become an effective tool in the hand of Christ for building disciples and building believers in the knowledge of Christ and effectively serving as a pastor over a local church. You know, once you start overseeing two, three, four, five people, that's already a church where two or three are gathered. That's what makes a church. So once you're already growing to where you're beginning to disciple people, you need to read this book on the office of the pastor so you can serve the people of God no matter how many they are effectively. That book is a good book. The third one I release is the Bible truth about material world. There's usually a clash between material world and the gospel. So this is sound exegesis on what Christ taught, the apostles taught, the New Testament theology where material wealth is concerned and how to use material wealth, you know, in serving Christ and honoring Christ. Then there's the material I also released is a free material. And that book is on eternal salvation in Christ. It deals with all the scriptures that throw doubts on salvation being eternal or salvation being forever. All those scriptures in the Bible, including the famous Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, sound exegesis. But the exciting thing is that this particular book is free. We're giving it free, both in hard copy from our office and online. We have an online edition. I want to pray for you. I decree and I declare that you are bound in knowledge. You are bound in grace. The eyes of your understanding being flooded with light. That you grow and grow into the fullness of God. And above all, that the revelation of Jesus grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke sickness and disease. We command sick bodies be healed. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. You don't want to miss the next broadcast coming up tomorrow, 12 noon, GMT plus one, as we continue with the 60 days of glory extended, questions, answers, and the teaching of God's word. We love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. <music>